Hey guys, welcome back to How to Roll Dice. I'm Josh, and today, as you can tell, we are not in my normal studio space. We are in my backyard, and that is because I'm going to be working on my new gaming table. Uh, you guys may have noticed that in my recent videos, I did have a gaming table that I slapped together. Uh, it wasn't very well built, though. It was kind of just an ad hoc sort of thing. Uh, for this one, I've learned a little bit from that first project, and I've done a little bit of research. I've gone out and purchased some better supplies, and I'm hoping that this one's gonna turn out a lot better. And I wanted to document it and share it with you guys so that if you wanted to make one of your own, you would be able to replicate it. This table is going to be a four by six seated height gaming table. It's not going to be a standing or bar top height, and it's going to cost right around hundred dollars. That doesn't factor in the tools that you're going to need to get the job done. That's sort of just something I assume you have lying around. If you don't, probably something you want to invest in over your, sort of your, your years as you become an adult, because having things like a power drill and a circular saw, maybe a reciprocal saw, you're going to be able to get a lot done. You're going to be able to take on a lot of projects. And so this is going to use a few basic power tools and some hand tools uh, and right around $100 in supplies as far as lumber and hardware goes. But in the end, we're going to have what should be a very nice gaming table for anywhere between two and six players. So behind me right here, what we have is the lumber that I'm going to be using for this table. So we've got ourselves, I uh, hope you guys can see that, we've got ourselves three four by four by eights. Those are standard, uh, I wanna say it's Douglas fir, so basically your typical construction stuff. We have three two by four by eights. Again, those are just your standard uh, white wood. You wanna make sure that those are finished pretty clean. You don't wanna get the rough stuff. They do have some cheaper wood that's got like a rough saw finish to it. That's nice if you're going for like a, a natural fencing or a very natural type feel. But for something that people are gonna be rubbing up against, resting their arms on, possibly resting their elbows on, things like that, you wanna have a nice smooth finish. And if you have a power sander, obviously, a hand sander or a belt sander, you can take care of that and add a nice clean finish to it, make it nice and smooth, sort of start with maybe like a 40 grit, move up to an 80, a 120, maybe even a 220, um, and that'll get your wood nice and smooth. But in this case, I figured I'd spend a couple extra bucks per board and just have that taken care of from the get-go. Uh, the last thing that we have here is this wooden dowel. Uh, that is a six foot long, three quarter inch poplar wooden dowel. And that's because I'm going to be dowel setting the legs onto the table instead of drilling into them. I'm gonna be jointing them in with thick dowel. Um, that should make it a lot sturdier and should sort of provide the additional um, structural integrity that my last table was lacking. The last table was very wobbly and that's because I couldn't properly fit the legs. Uh, with this one, it should be a lot more rigid as far as like how it sits on the floor goes. That and the additional weight from using heavier lumber. Uh, on top of that, I'm also going to be using actual table legs. I have those inside. Uh, I'll get some footage of those for you guys so you can see them, but basically they're leftover table legs from a table that I disassembled, which was well beyond its years, had a warped top, needed to be thrown out. Uh, and so I salvaged the legs off of that. Those are very sturdy looking legs and they're designed to be fitted into a four inch frame, which is obviously what we're gonna be making here using these four by fours. Um, so it should fit nicely or the legs should fit nicely onto this table. Um, yeah, so let's go ahead and uh, maybe start cutting some wood here. So the only other wood that I'm gonna be using that I haven't shown you guys so far, these are the table legs that I was talking about. As you can see, they've got some rough spots towards the top of them where they were attached to the last table. Uh, you can see a little bit of hardware sticking out there. I'm gonna to have to either cut or remove that using a wrench uh, or some pliers because they basically ripped off or broke off while I was removing them from the last table. Um, the remnants of which you can see right over there under that box. That was the old table. Um, the other thing is this particle board uh, here, or not particle board, but uh, chipboard. This sort of cheap, I don't want to say low quality because it's got a lot of good uses, but this cheap plywood. Um, this is, I want to say it's quarter inch or half inch plywood. It's cut into two by four sheets. If you buy it in the store, it's going to come in a four by four or a four by eight foot sheet and you can have them cut it for you to make it easier for transport. We're basically going to use three sections of that to make our six foot by four foot tabletop. That stuff is very cheap to come by. Um, you probably have some lying around if you have a garage or uh, you know an old wood pile. Also, if you know anybody in construction, this is a very common material that they basically see as useless once certain bits have been cut out of it, you know, so you might be able to pick up some scrap that you can use. Uh, but yeah, even if not, it's very, very cheap. I would say the most expensive wood that I had to buy or that you would have to buy would be these table legs. And you don't have to go with these nice, fancy table legs. You can actually just go with an additional couple of uh, four by fours and use those as the legs because four by fours make great sturdy table legs. These are just a little bit fancier and I had them lying around. Okay, so the tool of the hour is going to be this uh, 20 volt DeWalt circular saw, uh, cordless, obviously, six and a half inch blade, pretty standard. 
Um, if you don't have one, that's probably the first thing you wanna pick up after a good power drill. DeWalt makes a great 20 volt power drill and all of the batteries are interchangeable. So that's very convenient. Um, I also have my square so that I can measure. Um, this is a two foot long square. So I'm basically gonna be measuring two segments on each of the boards that I need to cut into four foot. I have, so the four by fours come as an eight foot long board. I need to cut one of those right down the middle and get two four foot four by fours. And then the other two four by fours, I'm gonna cut down from eight feet to six feet. Those are gonna be our side pieces. And then the four foot sections are gonna be the end pieces of our frame. Once we have those cut out, we're gonna lay out our plywood into our sort of four by six section, which is gonna be three segments of two by four, uh, two by two foot by four foot plywood and then we'll attach our frame to our tabletop and we'll sort of have the beginnings of our table, our tabletop with our underframe. Uh, from there, we'll start cutting and modifying the two by fours. I'm gonna go a little above and beyond what I did with my previous table as far as creature comforts. You definitely don't need to do this because it requires buying some sort of customized tools, but I bought two hole saws so that I can cut three inch and three and a half inch holes into the sort of top armrest border frame of the table. And that's gonna be for cup holders and for token holders because I figured why not. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and get cutting with our four by fours. Okay, so first major dilemma. Um, for some reason, my brain doesn't like to think of these things until it's already happened. Uh, a six and a half inch saw blade on a circular saw means that you can only cut through about three and a quarter pieces, uh, inches of wood. And that's just shy of cutting through a four by four, which means I'm gonna have to go ahead and switch over to my miter saw here. Um, I hate to keep throwing tools at you guys, but again, this is probably something that you should have lying around for cutting thicker cuts of wood. Um, so this should be able to chop through no problem. I believe this is a 10 or a 12 inch blade. So four by four is a piece of cake. Now that I've had to make that correction, I'm gonna go ahead and remeasure this shorter piece of wood because I had to cut off about an extra half inch to fix that against the unscrewed up piece of wood. Uh, and that's gonna let me know how much shorter I need to make that. So the table's going to be uh, an inch less wide than I intended for it to be. But these are the things that happen when you're winging it. So oddly, and I'm not exactly sure how, they're already the exact same length. I just need to clean up the, the bad cut on one end. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. So even after goofing those cuts up, it's not like you need to redesign the table or anything like that. It just means that, like I said, it's gonna be a little bit more narrow by an inch or two than expected, which means there's gonna be a little bit of overhang on the center of the table. If we want to, we can clean that up, but uh, it should be fine. All right, so a minor second dilemma. Um, the sheets that were supposed to be two foot by four foot of chipboard that I have, the plywood that's gonna make the tabletop, they're actually just shy of two foot wide. They're four foot long, uh, but they're about 23 and a half, maybe 23 inches wide. Again, not that big a deal. Basically, once we get the whole table together, if anything needs to be trimmed or shortened up or adjusted, uh, we can sort of figure that out on the go. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and cut the two uh, four by four by eights into six foot long sections. And then we'll have the four sides of our frame and we can start fitting that to our plywood and see how it fits up. So now we've got the rough frame of our table pieces ready to go. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, sort of find a spot to lay this out so that we can go ahead and see how it fits. Also, if you guys are, uh, if you guys are working and you notice any rough spots in your wood like this, which can happen sometimes during shipping or the way that it's zip tied together when the lumber comes into the hardware store, um, don't worry about that because all you have to do is face that side of the table away from where anybody would be sitting. So in towards the center of the table where nobody can rub up against it and you'll be good to go. If you have it on more than one side and it's really bad, you can always sand it off. One thing that I am terrible at is clearing out enough workspace for projects of this side. My my back porch is constantly covered in stuff and it makes laying out a four foot by six foot flat area a little annoying unless you do it before you get started, which I never seem to think to do.
Okay, so this is exactly what I was talking about when I said the sections of chipboard aren't exactly two foot wide. They're four foot across, but they're only about 23 inches wide. And so even though our end pieces fit perfectly, I mean, you can see that lines up edge to edge. Uh, and you can't quite see this edge, I'll move this for you. That lines up edge to edge with the chipboard there, which is great. That's what we're looking for. Our side pieces extend uh, well beyond the end of where they would touch. So this would, in theory, butt up there. Um, actually, it would butt up inside there. So I cut it wrong regardless because I should have accounted for the four x four itself. But that would butt up there, obviously on the chipboard. And then this end is obviously way too long. So we are going to make some adjustments. Um, I'm gonna decide, let me think now. So we could either, we could either make the table shorter um, by cutting down the six foot sidebars, or we could make it longer with some overhang by simply adding another piece of chipboard, which may be the way to go. Let's experiment. So I think I'm gonna go ahead and just shorten the sideboards instead of adding another piece of chipboard. Uh, I just double checked and it looks like each section of chipboard is only one inch off, which means the table overall is only gonna be three inches less in length than expected as opposed to, what would the inverse of that be, 21 inches longer? So uh, one of those is a much bigger difference than the other. So we're gonna go with the shortening of the sideboards instead of adding a whole new chipboard. All right, so I measured out the difference between our two end boards onto our six foot sections. It looks like somewhere between eight inches off of each board we're gonna be cutting off, which makes sense because four inches there and four inches here. So I'm gonna go ahead and shorten these up and everything should fit together nicely. Then we can start actually drilling things down. Also, I want to point out, it may have looked like I was cutting very close to my own hand just there, and I was in some sense, probably about three inches away. It's important to bring your saw blade down without it spinning to make sure that you have proper clearance from your hand and to make sure that you're lined up with your actual cut mark. Something else you might come across is a bunch of large construction staples in the end of your piece of wood, which will prevent it from abutting another section properly. Just go ahead and grab a pair of pliers and yank those out. Okay, so you can see that this now fits a lot better together. Everything's abutted nicely. Everything lines up right with the edge of both the particle board and the separate pieces of frame. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna basically invert this. We're gonna remove the particle, but not the particle board, the chipboard. I keep saying particle board. Particle board is the stuff that you get when you buy furniture from like Ikea or Wayfair. It's lower than plywood. It's actually basically wood pulp that gets compressed back together with a glue. And so if it gets wet, that glue can soften and the entire thing falls apart, which is why that type of furniture can't get wet at all. Um, this type of plywood is like a step above that. Instead of being wood pulp that gets compressed back together, this is actually entire sections of chipped wood. That's why it's called chipboard. That's reattached together with an adhesive so it's sturdier because it's larger segments of actual wood fiber as opposed to just being basically turned into sawdust and then squeezed back into a mold to make cheap boards, which is what that cheap type of particle board furniture is. So still not as solid as actual wood, which is why we're using really good sturdy wood for the frame and for the top but because the tabletop is basically going to be invisible, it's gonna be covered with felt lining, nobody's ever gonna see it unless you climbed under the table and looked up. You certainly don't need to waste a lot of money on it if you're looking for a cheap alternative to a $5,000 gaming table. 
Also, another thing that's worth pointing out if you haven't worked with plywood in general before, it generally has a rough side and a smooth side, or basically a, a finished and an unfinished side. So I know it's hard to tell, but this side here is nice and smooth. And then this side here is rough. I mean, granted, I also have marks on this side, so that's the side I'm gonna want uh, facing down if it's gonna be exposed. But in this case, it doesn't matter because you're either gonna have the underside of the table that nobody's gonna see, or the side that's hidden underneath the felt, which no one's gonna see. So it doesn't matter in this case, but for good practice, I would keep in mind, you wanna be working with or showing your smooth side. This is another good point here uh, where you can sort of hide some rough spots like I mentioned because this is this face upside right now is what the tabletop is going to sit on top of. Those sections of these boards are going to be permanently hidden. So roll your boards over and see if you have any rough spots on any of the sides and if you do just mount the tabletop to that side and you've now completely hidden that rough spot you don't have to deal with it later. See, I've got this big gouge here on this one that's going to be completely hidden by the tabletop. All right, so I've got all my corners as squared up as I can get them. I'm going to go ahead and start very carefully laying my chipboard over the top because I don't want to lay it down and slide it because that'll push this alignment out of place. I want to lower it down right into position so that I don't move these baseboards around. I'm not going to be tacking these to each other, which I should do, uh, but I don't have a dovetail joint, not a dovetail, but I don't have a pocket joiner, which allows you to actually insert a screw at an angle from one into the next. Otherwise I would. Also working with four by fours, you need very large screws or bolts and um, I just don't think I'm gonna need them. I'm gonna attach the tabletop to these. That's going to hold these in place. And then the legs are also gonna be doweled through these, which will help sort of structure everything together. As I add the boards, I'm just going around and adjusting the angle just a little bit to make sure that the top is squared onto the frame. All right, so this is what I was getting at here. You can see my actual frame. Those are butted up against each other nicely there. And you can see that if you look down from a top angle, that actual tabletop edge lines up nicely the whole way with that frame and you get corner to corner meeting there, which is what you want to see. And again, if you look down the line, you can see more or less, if my camera would focus, that basically everything is in line. And you kind of just want to give it a quick once around, all the way around the edges, making sure that all your corners line up, all your edges line up before you start drilling. And of course, that your tabletop pieces, if you are working in segments like I am, are as abutted as possible. Now there is going to be some difference like this right here where they're not quite um, pressed together, but that's fine for a couple of reasons. First off, once we add the two by fours uh, to the top to frame it, that's going to help make things a little more rigid, pull things into place. And then of course you have the fact that this is going to be felt lined. So that's going to be hidden underneath the felt anyways. Um, you're not really going to notice that. I've gone ahead and taken my sweater off because I was getting a little warm. It's always good to get a little warm while working on things. Uh, makes you feel manly. Um, and I, I feel comfortable saying that because I've looked at my channel analytics and 100% of my viewers are male uh, based off of YouTube's analytics. So uh, good job guys, I guess. Um, but anyways, one of the nice things about DeWalt tools, like I said, here's my DeWalt 20 volt drill. Here's my DeWalt 20 volt circular saw. Battery off. And battery on. Um, there's a meme going around out there. It's been around forever, but it's like you have to do two vuvus to the, the dad god before you can use any power tool. And like I do it innately without even thinking about it. So it's just hilarious how true it is. Um, but anyways, I'm going to be using these lovely decking screws. I like these a lot. These are uh, two inch decking screws with an eight millimeter thread. 
They're great for projects like this where you need to get good penetration, but not so good that you're actually splitting your board. Um, chipboard is gonna handle it pretty well. Four by fours are gonna handle it even better. If you were going into a really fragile wood or something that you feel like is gonna splinter easier, you should pre-tap all of your holes with a drill bit that matches your screw dimensions. Uh, the other nice thing about these is that they use a star hex head which does not strip. It locks in with your drill and it just drives the screw right in. A regular Phillips head or even worse, a flat head is going to strip, bend, you're gonna have a hard time getting it in. Even if you get it in, if you ever have to remove it to replace it or you wanna swap some parts out or repair something, it's gonna strip on the way out. You're gonna have a lot of problems. These guys are really nice and they're worth the extra dollar that they cost. Oh, and I forgot to mention, they actually come with the star hex bit. Uh, for your drill if you don't have one. So you don't even need to worry about that. Every pack of these comes with one of those. So I've got like nine of those floating around. Um, so drilling into this guy, we're gonna make sure that we sort of use some kind of a pattern for our screws for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, we're going to be then attaching the two by four sort of um, bumper bar slash elbow rest to the top of this after we get our felt and everything, which is gonna take another day. I forgot to go to the, the uh, fabric store, but um, we're gonna go ahead and be attaching those to the top of this. So just as an example, the two by fours, and I'm gonna do this very carefully as to not shift my chipboard, but they're gonna sit, if I didn't have a planter in the way, I'll just go ahead and knock that right off the porch. Um, they're gonna sit on the edge like this, right? And they're gonna go all the way around just like the frame did, except they're gonna be on the top. So the actual play table is gonna be in here and I'm gonna have my cup holders and my token slots cut into this, which I think is gonna be pretty nice. Now, because I'm going to be attaching this to the tabletop, through the tabletop and into the four by fours, uh, we're also gonna to wanna to make sure that we know where our screws are on either side so that you're not accidentally drilling into a screw. Um, I think I'm actually going to use finishing nails for this, uh, two and a half inch finishing nails, because they're gonna be a little bit more hidden than a, uh, than a screw would be. A screw head's kind of ugly, and if you're gonna do a screw head on your finished face, you probably want to recess it um, and then use a little bit of wood glue to fill it and sand it smooth before you paint it or before you put any kind of a stain on it just so that it looks a little bit nicer than a visible screw head. And with the number of screws that we're gonna be putting into these top bars, we don't wanna use screws because that'd be a lot of cover-up work, so we're gonna use finishing nails, uh, which I have inside. The only downside to finishing nails is that if you're not good at putting them in, you will bend them and then you have to pull it out, put a new one in. If you do that too many times, you're gonna ruin your wood, uh, which is frustrating. You can always sand it afterwards to get those sort of screw up blemishes out of it. But uh, yeah, you know, you can't really win. <laughs> Either you're gonna go with screws, which don't look good and take a lot of time to hide, or you go with finishing nails, which are a lot less visible, but are easier to screw up, which then create blemishes, which are harder to hide. So you just kind of have to practice, that's all. All right, so I think we're gonna go with the corners and then we're gonna go every, I think, one foot um, around the table uh, should be good. So we're looking at, given that we have a four foot side, we're looking at screws on the corners and then three other screws, one a foot in, a foot in from that, a foot in from that. Did I do that math correctly? Possibly, who knows? Um, and then going down the side, we're looking at five or six more screws centered between the corners. So a good amount of sort of rigidity to this, holding it together. All right, so we've got the entire frame of our table attached. So if I go ahead and uh, lift this table up, it should be one piece. Now, I think what I may end up doing is grabbing another four x four and running it on the underside of the table from end to end right down the middle and running a row of screws right along that down the center of the table to really line everything up and give it some extra structure. I just don't have the four x four right now, so we'll have to grab one of those and tackle that tomorrow before we do the felt. Actually, you know what? We just had a contractor over to fix uh, a da some damage to our house. A car drove through part of our house. Um, and so we just had a contractor over to take care of that. Work's all done. We're just waiting on the plaster guy to come finish things up. However, uh, they left us behind this lovely two by four here that I totally forgot I had. That will work perfectly for a center brace. So let's go ahead and get that cut up and inserted and screwed into place. So it's not actually a two by four. I think it's a two by three, um, which is a, a weird cut of wood, but I'm sure it was something they needed for the work they were doing. So all I've done is I've put it beside our table along one of the longer edges, and I lined it up with the beginning and end of our side wall because that's basically the distance from one end piece to the other. 
and I marked it there. So I'm gonna cut it there. And when we flip our table over, this should fit perfectly down the center of the table. Then we'll go ahead and tap a bunch of screws through it, probably two per board, just like we did around the outside of the table. And that'll really cause all of that uh, chipboard to line up nicely on the top and give the center of the table some additional structure. Might even try to do a pocket joint um, or a couple of pocket uh, screws from this into the four by fours if I can make it work. Uh, you really need to pre-tap those and you really should be using a pocket um, jig, which is something that like sort of lines up and allows you to put those perfectly diagonal screws in. Uh, but I don't have one and they cost something like 25 or $30. So I'm not gonna bother going to grab one right now if I can do it by hand. And if I can't, I just won't do it. All right, let's see if this fits. So we're gonna lay this right down the center line here. I've actually <laughs> already got a center line mark because of the marks on my wood, that's funny enough. Um, I can already tell this table is going to be far more rigid and durable than the last one I built, purely based off of the weight of it. It's gonna sit really heavy on those legs and that's gonna make it really sturdy. Now that is something that I would call a perfect fit. Um, lines up nicely from edge to edge, cut lines up butted nice up against the end pieces. So I'm gonna go ahead and put uh, two screws per board into this guy. Now, the screws that we have should be fine because if you take a look at these, and you look at this board, you can see they do go through if I drive them in a little bit, but only about as much as we have plywood. Um, so we should be safe there. I could also, hmm, I could try to put the board in standing like this which would be even more structural because it's less likely for a board to bow this way than it is on its side like this. Um, but because this is a two by three instead of a two, uh, a four by four, instead of a two by four, um, it sits inside, which isn't bad. It just makes it really hard to properly drive these in because if I flip this over, they're gonna be, it's gonna be sitting, you know, half an inch away from the surface of the table that I wanna pull it up to. Also, that's a much narrower area to hit blind. Uh, screwing in. So I think what I'm going to do to play it safe is I'm going to put it in this way. I'm going to attach it flat like this, this way towards the tabletop, but to make sure that I don't drive through the top of my, uh, my chipboard, I'm going to stop about an eighth of an inch short. Uh, that should be plenty to grab the chipboard, but not so much so that it's going to risk coming through the other side. So just as a test, I drove that one basically all the way in. And there's a small bump on my chipboard, but the, the tip of the screw isn't coming through. So if I stop just short of that, I'll be good on all. You also wanna make sure that you put weight down on this board so it's pressed flush against your tabletop when you're screwing it in. Otherwise, you're gonna end up with a gap and it's not gonna do its job. And it doesn't matter that these are only gonna be, or that these are gonna be you know, partially sticking out an eighth of an inch there because again, it's the underside of the center of the table. Nobody's gonna see it, nobody's gonna feel it. All right, so probably gonna stop here for today. Been at this for about an hour, hour and a half. Not bad, we have the frame of the table, we have the tabletop done. Uh, what we're gonna do next, probably tomorrow sometime, is we're going to go ahead and cut our, uh, our bumper bars, our top boards, the two by fours, to length. And we're gonna go ahead and take those hole saws that I picked up and punch out our cup holders and our token slots because those are going to rest after we felt this. The next step would be to felt this, which is very simple and straightforward. I'll show you how that works. Um, we're then gonna be attaching those, like I said, using finish nails to the top of this. And so even though they're complete punch throughs on the two by four, the inside is gonna be resting against that nice felt liner. So the insides of your cup holders and your token trays will also be felted just by doing it in that order, felt then two by fours on top. So we'll punch the holes out first so that when we lay them on top, you don't have to do any drilling into the felt once it's in place. After that, we basically have our entire table done. The only thing that we have to do is actually bring it down to the basement, which is going to be my new studio game room office, and attach the legs to it, which is going to be taking a three quarter inch um, hold, uh, yeah, hole drill, 
drill, I suppose, um, and punch out two dowel holes through the 4x4s into the 4x4 tops of the legs and then dowel those in with some wood glue and let that rest for 24 to 48 hours before trimming them and sanding everything down uh, and we have ourselves a gaming table. Um, but yeah, so this will be it for today. This looks good. A lot of additional rigidity across that middle from that uh, two by three. Everything's holding together really good. It's got some real sturdy weight to it. Um, really happy with how this is coming out so far. Oh, and last thing, just to see what we ended up with for a dimension, because now that it's together, this is going to be the table dimensions other than, you know, smoothing some corners and things like that. Uh, so we've got, that would be 24 inches right there. That's almost exactly 24 inches across. I'm sorry, uh, four feet across, which is what we were looking for. And then lengthwise, 24 here. Got another 24 there. Yeah, so we're, we're short about an inch and a half off of six feet, which again, is exactly what we wanted. So just by kind of doing some rough cuts and some on the fly adjustments, we ended up with basically exactly a four foot by six foot table, which is what we were going for. So, um, you know, measure twice, cut once is a great adage, except when you're lazy and you're just trying to do something cheap and on the fly and you're trying to learn how to work with wood as opposed to being, you know, the finest master craftsman in the area. Uh, you can just kind of wing it and, you know, fix your mistakes as you go in most cases. Um, when it's something like this, you know, if you were trying to make a beautiful piece for a gift or if you were gonna sell it, obviously you'd put more thought and effort into it, but I think this is coming out just fine the way we're doing things.